Welcome to our study of the Psalms, our continued study of the Psalms. We come this week to our 10th week of studying the Psalms. And uh, this is actually, this is a good place to start getting bored with a Bible study. If, if you notice, although this, um, although I'll say this just this week, I ran into a friend uh, at the store who, who told me how much she'd been enjoying this study. So apparently she's not bored with it yet. But if you notice, most Bible studies are about six to eight weeks max because people start getting bored with it. We, we seem to have short attention spans, and we want to move quickly from one thing to the next. And, and most Bible studies, if they can hold you that long, then they feel like they've done a good job. But, but in our women's Bible study, or East Dogs Women's Bible study, we spent, gee, we spent uh, over two years in, uh, in Matthew and then that much or more in John. Of course, part of that was due to the, some of the lockdowns uh, where we couldn't meet. But, but we study verse by verse and chapter by chapter. And, and so uh, you, have to, you have to have some stick to it in us to, to come to that study. But however you come to a study like this, when it's a long study, when it's in-depth, how you come to this study makes all the difference in whether or not you get bored with it. If you come to this study by saying, if you come to this psalm study by saying, well, gee, what psalm are we on this week? Then, then you've not done your homework. You've not studied the psalm. You've not... You've not given this psalm an opportunity to speak to you yet, to, to touch you and to in, intrigue you. You need, to, you need to spend time studying the scriptures. Read it over and over. Let it speak to you. Don't, don't be in, in such a hurry to get through a passage or to get through a section. Listen to the words. What is it saying to you? That, that's why I encourage for this psalm study and for our women's Bible study to, to read the scripture, read the psalm, in this case, every day to let it speak to you. But let's begin with, with our overview of this as, as we've been doing this every week. So what kind of psalm is this? What kind of psalm is Psalm 10? Is it a messianic psalm? Is it a teaching psalm? What is it? Well, it's a lamenting psalm. It's a, it's a psalm with a broken heart. It's a psalm that where we can cry out with the psalmist, why do bad things happen to good people? It's a prayer from the psalmist's heart as he's crying out to God. What feeling does this psalm evoke? It, it, there, there's great discouragement in this psalm. I mean, this can, this can be a pretty depressing psalm if you don't read it all. Verse 16 and on gives us our encouragement. What are, the, what are the references? Past, present, and future. It's all present tense. It's, it's something that is going on in David's life, if David is the writer, and I believe he is. But it, what it tells us is that these things are just as true today as it was in David's day. These things don't change. Just because we are in an era of great technology, of we say things are different today. No. Mankind is still the same. Mankind still has the same sin nature. We still have the same loves. We still have the same hearts. So these things are the same. So who is speaking? The psalmist is speaking. What does this, how does this remind me of Jesus? When we get to verse 16, we see the Lord is king forever and ever. And on, on that note, that brings to mind the the, the handles Messiah forever and ever. So what did I learn about God from this psalm? I learned that God is the helper of the orphan. Not just the literal orphan, those who were without mother and father. But as Jesus said to the disciples in John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you alone. I will send the comforter and the helper. God will be with the orphan when you feel all alone. So, how do, let's dig into this psalm. Psalm 10 can be broken down this way. As I said, the whole psalm is a prayer lifted to God by the brokenhearted and the discouraged. Now, I, I dare say there's not a one of us that has not fit into that category at some point in our lives. You may feel that way today. 
You may be broken hearted today. You may be discouraged today. If you are, this psalm is for you. Verse 1 is that universal question of mankind from the beginning until now, until Christ returns. Where is God when bad things happen? Verse 2, the first part of verse 2, presents the psalmist's summary statement for the whole psalm. Second part of verse 2 is what he wishes to see happening. This is the introduction to the psalm. Uh, verses 3 and 4 provide the reason that the psalmist wants God to act. Verses 5 through 11 is a description of the wicked, the wicked man and his actions. Verses 12 through 15 is the psalmist's plea to God for action. He's crying out to God, please do something. And then verses 16 through 18 is a vivid affirmation of faith, an affirmation of the psalmist's faith and an affirmation of our faith as well. So as you read over this psalm, and particularly if you read it over and over, if you read it every day, if you read it in different translations, if you let it speak to you, you will begin to see these divisions. As you, as you read Scripture, uh, particularly, like I said, as you read it over and over, you begin to see it being broken down. You begin to see one person speaking or another person speaking or a section that's a cry or a section that's an affirmation of faith. But that's one way that God's Word speaks to us. People will often say, I've heard people say that, you know, God speaks to them or the Holy Spirit speaks. And then I've heard other people say, I don't get that. What's wrong with me? I don't hear God speaking to me. I don't feel the Holy Spirit leading me. You have to listen. You have to notice it in Scripture. When a Scripture stirs your heart, then God is speaking to you in that still, small voice. It, it, we're not going to get into whether we hear God audibly or not, but you will hear God speaking in your heart, speaking to you, leading you. So, Psalm 10. Like I said, verse 1 of this psalm uh, opens with that universal question of mankind. Where is God when bad things happen? The psalmist puts it this way. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In other words, where were you when this happened to me? Where were you when this happened to this person or that person? In my Bible, I have added the words there. Why does it seem like? Because we know God is omnipotent and, and omnipresent. We know God is everywhere. God is, is never far, I think another psalm says, from the broken hearted. But why does it seem like? Why does it seem like you stand afar off, oh God? I mean, we know God is always there. But aren't there times when it seems like he's afar off? You, you may have heard, heard the, the quote or the cliche, if you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? And, and we know that God isn't hidden in times of trouble. But it seems like. Why does it seem like you're far off? The second part of that verse says, um, Why dost thou hide thyself in times of trouble? That, that word hide there means to conceal. It seems like God is concealed. A better translation might be, Why do you conceal yourself? The word Hide or conceal, depending on what translation you're using, doesn't mean absent. God isn't gone. It means veiled. Sometimes we just can't see Him. Where is God when my heart breaks? He is the same place He has always been. He's on His throne. Where was God when 9-11 happened? Where was God when, think of any number of tragedies happened? Where was God? Same place he always was, on his throne. In fact, this, this friend that I ran into this week she said, uh, I think we need to teach, teach Psalm 2 in our churches. God is on his throne. Why do the nations rage? Why does it seem like the wicked are winning? God is on his throne. God will be king. God will be worshipped. So, God is always where he has been, on the throne. Things happen. They're beyond our comprehension. And the psalmist asks that same question that we do. 
why does it seem like God is not around when? He knows it's rhetorical. We know it's rhetorical. We know where God is. He goes on then in the first part of verse 2 to apprise the situation as he sees it. And he says, In pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. King James Version calls them the poor instead of afflicted. The NIV calls them the weak. Basically, it's anyone who's suffering. When you're suffering, you feel vulnerable. You feel poor. Maybe not materially, but you feel poor and you feel afflicted. Those who are suffering cannot care for themselves. You, you've heard the quote, perhaps, that says, God helps those who help themselves. Well, there's a theological answer for that, description of that, and it's baloney. God helps those. The Lord helps those who can't help themselves. Those who help themselves do. And many times feel like they don't need God. God helps those and cares for those who can't help themselves, who are down, who are lonely, who are needing to be lifted up. There are, there are other scriptures where it talks about the head being lifted up. It's like, like someone who, who can't, you know, you've seen in the old western someone out in the desert and they're thirsty and someone comes along with the canteen and they hold their head up and give them the water. That's this picture. God lifts them up when they can't lift themselves. The second part of verse 2 can be translated two different ways. And, and they're two legitimate ways. And you'll see this in different translations. That's why I encourage you to read out of different translations. The Inter New International Version translates it as, The weak are caught in the snares of the wicked. But almost every other translation translates it as the wicked are the ones who are caught in their own snares or, or in the plots they themselves have devised. And remember, we've seen that two or three times already in Psalms, particularly last week, and I, and I think it was Psalm 5 where we saw that. And we see it in, Pro in Proverbs, where the wicked fall into the snare that they themselves have laid. That's what happened to Haman, as you'll remember. And we see that many other places in Scripture. But in verses 3 and 4, and, and let me say this, those, those are both valid translations of this. My feeling is that it is more the wicked will fall into their own traps, more so than the, the suffering one has fallen there. But, but it could be that. In verses 3 and 4, we find the reason that the psalmist wants God to act. And he said, for the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. I mean, that, that right there is enough to want God to act. He goes on, the wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance, his attitude, does not seek him, does not seek God. All of this man's thoughts are, there is no God. So we see when we get to chapter 14, that's a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But that's what the wicked does. There is no God. You are God. All you need to do is follow social media a little bit, uh, Twitter, and say anything positive about God, and there will be those who say, it's in your imagination. There is no God. Well, we know that's the fool. But the psalmist is saying, <clears throat> this is why I believe God should judge the wicked. And he gives his reasons. First of all, they boast in their heart's desires. The greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. The, the, the godly man wants God to step up and deal with this. They do not seek God because they are prideful. And basically, they don't even believe there is a God. Or if there is, he's not relevant in their lives. But now, think about this for a minute. Should the psalmist be asking God to judge the wicked? I mean, do, do we get to ask God to judge the wicked? I mean, should we be asking God that? What, what about tolerance? What about uh, live and let live? What about judge not lest you be not judged? I mean, every unbeliever in the world knows that scripture. What about, well, everybody's beliefs are different. I respect your beliefs. So should we be asking God to judge the wicked? There, there are things I believe that, that we know for certain. 
if you believe scripture, we know for certain that God hates. If you go back and read Psalm 5 again, and we saw in that Psalm some of the things that God hates. God will judge sin. Period. Many places throughout the Bible we find things that God will judge. So, so yes, the man or woman of God can call upon God to judge the wicked. Because that's what God will do. And we can say, God, fulfill your word. God, do what you have said you're going to do. Well, reading then the next few verses, verses 5 to 11, we get this, we get this middle picture of the violence going on in our world. And I think I mentioned in a couple of other lessons how, how I put dates in it. It was this bad on this date. And, well, it's worse this year. And it's worse this year. And now we come to... 2022, and who would have ever believed that we would see some of the things that we're seeing? Evil and wicked. Although, although it's prophesied. God said this would happen. And we believed it would happen. We just never believed it would be in our lifetime. But it is. You read verses 5 through 11, and you see this happening. The New Living Translation puts it this way, Yet they, speaking of the wicked, they succeed in everything they do. I mean, doesn't it look that way? Doesn't it look like they're always getting by with stuff? They succeed in everything they do. They do not see your punishment awaiting them. They sneer at all their enemies. They think, nothing bad will ever happen to us. We will be free of trouble forever. Their mouths are full of cursing. Don't get me started on that. Of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are on the tips of their tongues. They lurk in ambush in the villages, waiting to murder innocent people. They're always searching for helpless victims. Like lions crouched in hiding, they wait to pounce on the helpless. Like hunters, they capture the helpless and they drag them away in nets. Their helpless victims are crushed. You know how many times it's using the word helpless there? Their helpless victims are crushed. They fall beneath the strength of the wicked. The wicked think, God isn't watching us. He has closed his eyes. Even if there is a God, he has closed his eyes. He won't even see what we do. Now that, my friends, is arrogance. And don't we see that everywhere? But Peter... In Peter's second letter, in chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about those who think that God has forgotten. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, Peter says, They, the unbelievers, will say, What's happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? They sneer at you. For from the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same as when the world began. You ever heard someone say that? It ain't nothing ever going to happen. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't going to do anything. It ain't nothing going to happen. This is the way it's always been. Nothing's ever going to change. But then Peter goes on in verses 8 through 10, and he said, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some think. No. He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come. That's a fact. The day of the Lord will come. And it will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth will and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Oh, my mind, my mind's racing as I'm reading that because I remember when we studied this, this uh, scripture in 2 Peter, and I keep wanting to go off on this tangent and that tangent. So maybe 2 Peter will be a good study for another time. But the bottom line is God is not slow, but God is patient. God does not want anyone to suffer. He does he wants everyone to come to repentance, but there will still come a day when God will judge. The wicked think God isn't watching. But he is. Back to Psalm 10. 
in verses 12 through 15, then the poor and innocent cry. They cry out to God for mercy and justice as the psalmist lifts his plea. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. You ever wonder sometimes, what am I supposed to be praying? How do I even pray? Pray these words. Pray these scriptures. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He has said to himself, God will not require it. You've seen it, for you have beheld mischief and vexation to take into your hand. The unfortunate, though, commits himself to you. Where else are we going to go? You have been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out this wickedness until you find none. In other words, Keep seeking it out until there is no more to be found. The psalmist said, Why does the wicked act like they do? They don't ever think God will do anything about it. But as we saw from Peter's words, God said he would judge, and he will. This, this is so reminiscent of Satan's words in Genesis chapter 3. Indeed, has God said, You, you really... You really think God's going to do that? Eve said, if we eat from this tree, of course she added, embellished it, if we even touch it, we will die. And Satan said, Psh, you really think God's going to do that? Has God really said, the wicked hold to that? Did God really mean it when he said he was going to judge? Sure he did. He does, and the psalmist is calling God to uphold his word. Sometimes I see the things going on and I just, just cry out for God to judge the wicked. I mean, let me throw this in here. This is not in my notes, but it just came to mind. In, uh, in 2 uh, Thessalonians, I believe it's in chapter 1, there, there is a, a section there where uh, Paul talks about uh, God bringing judgment or... or uh, uh, bringing judgment back on the ones who have, have caused uh, such trouble and, and such persecution for the Thessalonians. And when we studied that in our women's Bible study, it, it goes on in that, that verse or in verses following that to say that when the Lord returns, judgment will come. That's not when we want judgment, is it? I mean, we want to see it. We have this tendency to think if we don't get to see it, then it's not really justice. We want to see justice being done. Uh, words to a, in a movie says, I, I want to just hear of this happening. I want to see it happening. And we're like that. We think it's not true if we don't get to see it, but we can count on God said he would do it, and he will. The psalmist goes on to say, the unfortunate commits himself to you. The, the, the unfortunate, the poor, the one uh, who is struggling gives themselves to God. You have been the helper of orphans. Like we said earlier, that's not just those who have lost their parents, but anyone who feels alone. Toward the end of John chapter 6, it actually begins, and I remember this because of the numbering, in John chapter 6, verse 66, we see that Jesus had said some hard sayings. And many of those disciples, not the twelve, but many of the other followers left him. Because these were hard words. And Jesus turns to the disciples, turns to the twelve and says, Are you going to leave too? As, as we've studied, we, we've so often seen that Jesus never asks a question for informational purposes. God never asks a question for information. The questions come in order to make us think about it. So when Jesus asked that of the twelve, what he was really doing is making them think, am I going to leave too? And Peter, of course, speaking for the rest of them, says, where else are we going to go? What are we going to do? You alone have the words of eternal life. And the, the tense of that or the essence of that is, Peter is essentially saying, well, yeah, we'd like to. This is hard. 
It is hard to follow you. It is hard to do these things. It is hard to live this Christian life. But where else are we going to go? What else are we going to do? You alone have the words to eternal life. The unfortunate commits himself to you. You have been the helper of orphans. And then finally in verses 16 through 18, the psalmist then, as he so often does, issues a statement of faith that no matter what happens, no matter what happens in our lives, this statement will stand forever. And he said, the Lord is king forever and ever. And we hear Handel's Messiah Echoing forever and ever, the Lord reigns, King of kings, forever and ever, and Lord of lords. He goes on to say, nations have perished from his, from his land. And the picture there, uh, that word perish is like sifting sand through the fingers. It's just like they, he, he sifts them out. Nations have perished from his land. O oh Lord. You have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will, you will. See all the wills? You will, you will, you have, you will. You will incline your ear to vindicate the one who is alone, the orphan and the oppressed, so that the, that man, that man, that evil man who is of the earth, will no longer cause terror. What an encouragement that is. No matter what you're dealing with today, no matter what you're going through in your life, if you will put this statement of faith, if you will write this out, put it on a card, put it by your bed, put it, uh, we all use our phones so much, if you will put it as the wallpaper on your phone, or I'm more apt to put it on the refrigerator. If you will put this somewhere where you will see it every day, it will strengthen you. It will encourage you. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I just need to hear these words. So how do we pray this? Let's let that last statement there be our prayer. Father, we affirm that you are king forever and ever. Oh, it gives me chills just just saying those words and hearing that 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 handles Messiah echoing, King of kings and Lord of lords forever and ever and ever. Nations have perished from your land. Oh Lord, we believe that you have heard the desires of the humble. You have heard the desires of our heart. You will strengthen their heart. You will strengthen our hearts. And you will incline your ear to vindicate to judge for the orphan and the oppressed so that that man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. Praise God. We affirm and pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that this psalm has encouraged you and strengthened you and you're not getting bored with the psalms. May God bless you today. Amen.